And if life was simple and we had a we had a randomized trial that compared the two approaches, it would be great, but we don't. What we have is the survival curve from 2003 uh, and 2006 total therapy three, which shows that the chances of being alive at five years are about 70% with the approach of VDT pace, two transplants, VDT pace, VRD for three years. And these are studies, results that we published in cancer using my approach, which is risk adapted and for the vast majority of patients are allowing the patients to decide when to get the transplant. And whether we did an early transplant or delayed transplant, we are getting five years, 80%, and six years, 70%. Note that of the 272 patients we have treated with this approach, only half of them went on to the early transplant, and yet we are also getting the same 70% survival at five and six years of treatment. Uh, the, other, the other reason why I'm not so keen on whether cure is absolutely needed or not, at least in a molecular level, Dr. Barlow has shown that the vast majority of patients with myeloma, the low-risk patients, do just as well whether they got a complete response or not. And whether the, even if they didn't achieve a complete response, they do seem to do that well. So I think in these patients, controlling the disease may be enough. You don't need to cure uh, every, every single patient with that. And this is the last, last example. This is chronic myeloid leukemia. It is a disease where people know that you cannot cure it with the imatinib therapy. Just focus on this uh, yellow curve here. This is 10-year follow-up of patients treated with Gleevec, an oral pill. People know that you cannot cure patients with this. You look at this patient's hard enough, they still have CML. But it really doesn't matter whether we cure it or not. They're going to live, they, they're living almost a normal life by just controlling the disease. There are cures available, but you will, you will uh, have much inferior results. If you do allo transplant, you will have half the patients alive at that at that point in time. Uh, you have cure, but the patient is not alive. So what? So the final question is, when you have a problem like this, where I'm telling you that I'm getting the same results or similar results with a risk-adapted approach, where you go hard on the very high-risk patients and easy on the low-risk patients, and you have another approach where potentially some patients are actually cured and it never comes back, how do we actually get to decide what what is the right answer? And I, what I want to leave you with is that we have to do clinical trials. We have to do a comparative randomized trial because patients who come to Arkansas are different than patients who come to Mayo Clinic. And both places, patients are different than what the community actually sees. And we cannot make interpretations of what is good for the general population unless we have actually tested the general population to figure out what is indeed the best treatment for these people. Historically, if you look, People argued that various combination chemotherapy regimens were better than melphalanprednisone for myeloma. Yet in randomized trials, time and time again, people were shown that it was not true. You can get higher response rates, do not translate into better survival. You can have fantastic survival at MD Anderson. You move it to SWOG or ECOG, it didn't work like that. It was the same as that. When the CHOP chemotherapy was being used for Hodgkin's disease, people said it was malpractice to use CHOP because I'm using Promace cytobomb and I'm getting even more better responses than you are and I, my patients are living longer than your patients. And when you did the four best combination or three best combinations against CHOP in the New England Journal, the survival was exactly the same except CHOP was easier, safer, more, less toxic. We've had this over and over again, hormone replacement therapy, stem cell transplant. We have known that unless you do a randomized trial, it's my word against it. There's no way you can say who's right. And so this is how the FDA in general approves drugs, but I've modified it for our time. I think as far as clinical trials go, we should investigate both the total therapy type of approach as well as a milder, less aggressive approach, a cure approach as well as a control approach. That's what we are doing. I myself am doing trials similar to total therapy, with just go all in all the drugs, as well as doing just one drug at a time sequentially. So in a clinical trial, everything is game, and you have to applaud Bart because everything he showed you was done with informed consent on a clinical trial. It's not random treatments prescribed to patients and no follow-up. On the other hand, in the outside world, what is happening right now, which alarms me, is that people are taking simple phase two studies published in ASH and ASCO as an abstract and changing their whole clinical practice as a result. So 
in trials, we have to investigate both cure and control approaches. But in, when you want to say change clinical practice, you always go with a less aggressive approach first. And you, you show that the more aggressive approach is actually going to make people live longer or have better quality of life. Those are the only two metrics of clinical benefit. Not complete response, not progression-free survival. Do you live longer or do you have better quality of life? And the best way to test that is in a randomized trial. So if you want to change practice, we have to demonstrate clinical benefit and safety. And clinical benefit is only two things. Improved patient reported quality of life outcome or improved overall survival shown in at least two randomized trials. But I will give it that in a rare disease for myeloma, one randomized trial. And then we can change practice. Thank you so much. At, at this point, if Dr. Balogi would like to add some clarifications or uh, make comments, sure. and we'll let uh, Dr. Rajkumar also add another sentence or two before we open the floor to question and answer session from the public. I believe that until the time that the gene array emerged, we could not distinguish a flat portion on the curve. And I submit that we are dealing with several distinct entities, and this is not trying to do subgroup analyses. I have shown you in my office on the computer, the updated results as of 9.27, that's yesterday. Steve, I always have this, you know, once a week. And that curve is really flat. I noticed on your St. Jude slide, the earliest 60s study was indeed very flat. And I bet these people haven't been followed carefully. As, as you went higher, there were actually a few that dropped out and they may have died from secondary malignancies. Um, I think we need to, uh, in, in your presentation, you have relatively early data, and you are not showing me how these data stack up against what you had done previously at Mayo because your major effort, as I see it in the past, was operative group efforts. I think you need to give it to us that as we move from one to the next to the next study, uh, there is ongoing improvement, and I do believe that the vortezomib or Valcade made a huge difference. You and I have both seen, as we, my colleagues and I here, see patients who got uh, Revlimid and dexamethasone. I'll give you an example. Mayo South, patient, uh, high-risk disease, 814 translocation. They even had a gene array. Patient got induced, got a transplant, no maintenance. You know, that wasn't Rajkumar, but there was somebody else whose name I'm not going to use. But it was totally predictable that that person would be relapsing. So that person comes here, and if you then have a high-risk disease, already have a relapse, the probability of curing becomes very low. Now, my entire uh, makeup is different from yours, that's clear. And I do come from the uh, a generation spanning approach. When I entered the field, there was no cure for any disease. So I've seen the cures in AML, albeit very low. I've seen them happen in testes and lymphoma and so on. When you use the example of CHOP in large cell lymphoma, I disagree with you. Because we now know there are different types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and they deserve different <coughs> approaches. And unless you study this, even with the best therapy, there are still 25 or 30 percent of all non-Hodgkin large cell lymphomas that are dying. 
So I think until such time that there is universal cure, the cancer centers and the individual larger institutions with a dedicated focus on one single disease are here to make the progress. And this has happened at St. Jude beautifully for pediatric oncology where in the general population, 80, 90% of patients are enrolled in clinical trials. In adults, it's 10% or less. You know, because I'm not going to say, but I just, you know, some will say, well, you know, they're being treated in private practice. People want to be in private practice and, you know, ching ching. And it's not the ching ching of the doctor as much as it is the ching ching where the companies who invested billions of dollars to discover, they want to get the return on it. Um, I told you earlier, we like to work together on basic science, and maybe uh, if we hang out and come back here a couple of years later, um, you may be more similar to me and I'm more similar to you. <laughs> You know, all I'm saying is that I think uh, there, there is probably subsets of patients who derive remarkable benefit from total therapy approaches. Uh, and I think what we need to do is that it, you don't want to do total therapy only in Arkansas. You want to have other people do it as well. So I think if we can work together, at least for the high-risk myeloma patients, to test these against other approaches, uh, then I think more patients can benefit. And I think it just calls for randomized controlled trials. And I, I totally agree with you. It's in single centers like Mayo or Arkansas, it is not possible to do these randomized trials. In the US, it's become very hard to do randomized trials because the moment you start talking about giving patients, you know, Lendex and one transplant maybe or not, versus a total therapy, patients are either going to choose one or the other. They just don't want to be randomized. So what I'm proposing is, 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 is becoming almost impractical. So I, I don't know how exactly you're going to Well, I, I think we, we do have the opportunity for intense collaboration in the high-risk disease setting. It's 15% or 20% of the patients. They have a predictable short progression free survival under two years. And 80% of people are dead or have had a recurrence by three and a half years. Now, if we focus on that and test them, whether the easy or whatever approach yeah. works, then we can take this with greater confidence into the intermediate or easy risk disease. But let's do that in order to get data in a short period of time. And if we all commit to this, I am the first to do no treatment anymore. But until that time, I'm going to stick to my guns. And I would be fired because there, we were, the referral would drop. You know, I mean, that is, <laughs> after all, that's what we're all about, right, Kent? The governor would not be happy. <laughs> Thank you both. That was fantastic. <laughs> now, before you leave, let me ask you this question and raise your hand. Do you think we can cure multiple myeloma or some subsets of multiple myeloma? I think, you know, the, the audience has spoken. I, I don't have numbers, but it's overwhelmingly, yes, we can cure multiple myeloma. Thank you both, and we'll see you in three months with the next session of this series.